What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of A Fistful of Collars. It is your favorite jujitsu podcast back. And things look a little bit different this week. I'm looking around the table. You're not Reed. Nope. You're not Chase. You're not Will. <laughs> Who do we have at the table? Well, first things first, we've got none other than Mr. Creative Transitions himself, the human monkey, Jeff Glover, joining us here in the oh, studio. S- Jeff, woo, oh. what's up? Hello. Give it up for Jeff. Come yeah, on, you guys. Yeah, yeah there myself. we go. Yeah. <laughs> Joined today by Armin Armirian, our Flow Elite Senior Editor, That's who's me. also a uh, Jiu-Jitsu practitioner himself. There are more of us than you would think in Flow, right? That's right. It's a secret cult inside of the Flow, the Flow Sports Empire. Bit by bit, Flow Grappling, we're going to take we're over the whole taking company. Taking every site. That's right. And once again, Tony is joining us again. Our documentary maker extraordinaire is back at it. Man, it's a, a little bit different this week, but it's kind of cool. You're probably wondering where everybody is. Well. Last weekend, we had a couple of big events and we got one coming up this weekend too. So Chase is in Guam for Mariana's Open. He's only been talking about that for like three weeks. It's like every opportunity, he's like, I'm going to Guam. <laughs> yeah, rub it in, why don't you? Yeah. I saw him at the, I was getting coffee and I bumped into him. I was like, hey man, how's the travel schedule going? He's like, oh, no big deal, but I'm going to Guam. I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. Very cool. Sweet. Very, very cool indeed. And uh, the boys, uh, Reed and Will, they were in New York last weekend for Kazai Pro. Uh, man, what a show. Did you guys watch? Incredible. Yeah. Awesome show. And with one of the result that everybody's talking about, right? Nikki Ryan versus Gio Martinez. Damn, dude. Damn. Exciting. What did you think about that, Jeff? Because uh, you got a little bit of history with Gio. You know, you competed against him a couple of times. Yeah. And everybody knows Nikki Ryan, right? Yeah. So what did you think about the match? Yeah. Um, gosh, it's like the Super Bowl. It's like a pro wrestling event now. It's like super <laughs> exciting. Uh, like challenge matches, 10,000 bucks getting thrown around here and there like it's nothing. It's um, not nothing. I mean, they're doing not it, nothing. These Let's guys just are say throwing that. it. Everybody's like, yo, I'm challenging for 10K. And uh, it's definitely different from, you know, my era. My era is, was like, if we fought each other, it was for 10K, it was like at ADCC, and you would have to win the division. You and that was every saying? two years. And yeah. was, you'd have to win <laughs> every two years. So now it's like any pro event comes up, you can challenge somebody and throw 10K at them, and it sounds cool. It's a challenge. You know, put somebody on the spot. Somebody has to respond and, and either decline and look like a chicken mm. or accept it and, and look bravado. So And it's high stakes, right? High so, stakes, yeah. I mean, like, that's the thing, you know, you know, a, a head-to-head match, there's a lot riding on that, right? Everybody's pride, everybody's, uh, you know, representing the team and stuff. Mm. But when you've got 10 grand on the line, like, how does that, how does that change things? Yeah. Like, yeah, it sucks to lose that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, you already spend the money. You're like, I already bought this. God damn it. You gotta ask for that show money. Yeah, right. Got yeah. another $10,000 worth of spats incoming. What am I gonna do with all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think about the match though? I mean, like, Nikki versus Gio, 16 year old kid taking on a 31 year old and winning the decision. It's kind of wild, huh? It is pretty wild. I mean, I, I remember when I, we first started hearing that, hey, like, who would win? Like, it, I, I feel like it started off with this really strange hypothetical, like who would win between the best 10th Planet guy and this kid, this child who <laughs> like showed up, like everyone knows, but he like really showed up on the scene at ADCC in that match against AJ was yeah. incredible. And I remember thinking like, oh, that, that's a cool hypothetical, but it'll never happen. And like fast forward to last weekend and it, it was, basically everything you would wanted it to be. It was, it was awesome. It was really uh, cool. Man, for me, I think one of my favorite things about it was the, was the drama because, you know, like you said, it's kind of WWE a little bit, right? Pro wrestling, you know, everybody's shit talking and stuff. Mm-hmm. But actually, there wasn't any of the shit talking up to this match. Like, everybody was taking it dead fucking serious, right? <laughs> there was a lot riding on that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the match itself, I thought was, was, it was fun to watch for sure, uh, the viewer, but um, you know, I thought it was pretty back and forth, and, and then to the end there, when Nikki kind of threw on that triangle at the end. But, um, they faked that, like, yeah. he was going to go under the thigh for a leg attack, and mm-hmm. then Gio pulled back and, like, kind of slipped right into it. Yeah. Man, tactically, like, what did you think of the match? Like, would Nikki, mm-hmm. you know, everybody knows him as kind of, like, down her death squad, leg locks and stuff, but, you know, Gio, kind of, he knows what's going on. He's gone up against those guys in the past. But, yeah. like, did you expect Nikki to kind of go for, like, the triangle attack? Gio is hard to leg lock. Yeah? He is hard to leg lock. Um, Why is that? Triangles seem to or? be a problem for Gio, though. I've seen several people put him into triangles. And he, wa- he kind of, like, has a style where he walks into those at, at the end of transitions. At the end of scrambles, if you pop a triangle, there's a chance you might be able to get Gio into it. Mm. Um, now, I'll, I'll tell you triangles. this, he does get out of triangles. He's tough. He's tough to finish in anything. So we did see Nikki put him in the triangle mm-hmm. and start working on him. And um, 
I don't know who's to say that G if it had gone on, yeah. you know, Gio wouldn't have got out. Right. You know, that's that's another factor is like people's escapes. Is he strong as people say? Sure, he's a pretty strong dude. He is. You know, because um, like that's another thing, right? I mean, he's not a power strength. lifter. No, sure, <laughs> he's a featherweight, but man strength. Like you know, I remember when I was a sixteen-year-old kid. Like I. I man could just push me over easily, right? I mean, even if Nikki is training all the time and stuff, still, he's a 16-year-old kid, right? But he rolls with grown men every day. I think mm -hmm. if you look at him, his training videos over at Henzo's every day, he's doing that, I mean, against, you know, the biggest, I mean, just huge guys yeah. at Henzo's, right? I mean, I mean it, he's all grown men. Probably, the, he's one of the smaller guys that trains in that crew, right? He's, they got a, they a, got a bunch of like dude. lightweight and guys, like I guess. And, yeah, yeah, they got Calistine, you know, he competes as low as like 135, and there's Ethan Krillenstein is another 145er. Uh, they got Oliver Taza who floats around around 150, 155. But uh, I mean, he's on the lower end, yeah, for sure. You know, he's not Gordon size, right? Yet. Oh, yet, yet. Right. Yeah. Once he, <laughs> once he once he becomes of age and starts lifting a little bit, I think I think that'll probably change. Becomes of age. This is the key phrase, right? This kid, he can't even buy a pack of smokes, right? <laughs> Let alone, you know, like I'll say this. Buy beer there are some kids that are exceptionally coordinated at a young age. I'll, I'll, I'll drop Bill Cooper. Yeah. By the time Bill Cooper was 15, he was winning all the Purple Belt Division tournaments in Southern California and tapping everybody. Damn. Before it was like sub only. And he was 15. This was, I think, 15, he was Blue Belt, Purple Belt. 16, 17, he was Purple Belt. And then 18, 19, Brown Belt. Got his Black Belt when he was 20. So this is it. I mean, like everybody talks about Nikki, like, oh my God, this 16 year old phenomenon is like is a brand new thing, but it's not. It's like people have been awesome yeah. when they were teenagers. And it's for always a very cool though. Time. They always get attention. Bill got a lot of attention for that. And Nikki's getting a lot of attention and they both deserve it. Mm. I'll tell you, Bill worked very hard when he was 16, 17, 18, 15, 14. The kid was in there training every day. But what was he doing, like competing wise? Was he going out into like open tournaments, or was he doing sure. like Nikki? Was he was he calling people out for super fights, or? Well, it's a different time. Those right. that wasn't happening. Right. That wasn't happening. But you know, um, I mean, he had his epic match where him and Crone were both 16 years old, what? and they made it to the finals of Kleber Luciano's Copa Pacifica tournament, and they both tapped their way to the finals at 16, purple belt. And this was That's back. So legit. Dude, this was back in <laughs> in so o, o three, or something like that. Uh huh. I forget the year, and um, it was like at the time that was one of those like, what are these kids, dude? Yeah. These kids, and and you know, Crone's camp, Bill's camp. We were not surprised. I was at the tournament like, duh, Bill. I knew that this was gonna happen. I was like, none of these twenty-year-olds can fuck with Bill wow. or Crone. None of these twenty, thirty-year-old dudes were all like Jack. Doesn't matter. These kids' technique, hard work, and the amount of mat time they put in will surpass that man strength. You that's know? that's one of the things you just mentioned right there is the math time, you know? So like Nikki, uh, he's homeschooled right now. He, he dropped out of school so that he can Beautiful. go train, you know, early in the morning, do that's lunchtime true. class, go do some, you know, studying in the afternoon and then train again at night. But like when Bill was that age, what was he doing? He was, was also homeschooled. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> Bill was homeschooled. That's funny. There you go, man. Mm. Homeschooling. Get your kids in homeschooling. <laughs> <laughs> Get your kids. And there's a ton of these kids out there doing that. A lot of the AOJ <coughs> kids, you know, out of Jiu Jitsu, Ooh. the Mendez brothers, they've got this gigantic juvenile squad True. who are just like killing it at all the tournaments, they're, like taking the team trophies and stuff. And they're like, same thing, 15, 16, 17 years old, and they are just beating grown ass men. Dude, it's that's really scary, good. dude. They are scary. And th <laughs> what's scary for me, though, is that. They've been training full time since they were like 11 or 12. Yeah, just wait, dude. That's all muscle memory. That's going to like develop into real serious, dangerous uh, fighters soon. When those kids all turn 18 and 20, dude, and if, they, and if any of them choose to become serious grapplers, holy moly. I mean, what that's for me, that's like by the time they get to 19 or 20, they're going to be like a black belt world champion, right? Yeah. You know, it's not like they got to fight for years to kind of get to that level. Once they get there, they're already hit the ground running. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting because of, I think, how that, that age old skill versus strength, technique versus strength argument, I think the kids are a really interesting example as to why that argument is still, is still around, right? You have these kids at the very, very, um, very like, perfect time of their life are spending all this time they're resilient they soak up skills very quickly like they can they can adapt to like learning these techniques really quickly and yet they can still hang with someone like geo who's got grown man strength right you know he's been doing this for so long and you know he's he's one of the best in the game he's up against what people would say is a child and yet nikki's able to hang with them because you know he's he's put in the time he's put in all of that time to like learn the techniques 
and is able to go toe to toe, even if necessary, like physically as sort of as as a specimen isn't quite there. So the question is, what happens when he becomes when he a physical matures, specimen? Right? When yeah. he actually like grows into his frame, because he's still kind of like a gangly teenager, yeah. you know? He's still kind of got that he has slightly... A, he has a child's head like on, he a, on like an adult body mm -hmm. right now. So what right. happens when he fills out? Because, I mean, Gordon was super skinny up until he was like 20. And then, you know, obviously we know what happened there. He got big, right? Now, I'm not saying that he's going to get the same size as Gordon, but... Who knows that, you know, if he does sort of like fill into his frame, like what he's going to be capable awesome. of when he matches that, right? That's cool. Yeah. But I got a question for you, Jeff, actually, because, you know, you've seen this, you've been around such a long time now, and I'm sure you've seen these kids come through really promising talents. But like the kids who peak really early like that, is there a risk sometimes that they just like, that's it, they kind of peak and then they kind of like just burn out and they're done? Right. Right. That happens all the time. You seen it? Sure. Yeah. Because I mean, like, I've Nikki, dealt with it, and you, yeah. You know, I've seen it happen so many times. Of course, yeah. Because I mean, like, Nikki's like 16, and he's like, you know, achieving pretty much everything he can possibly do. Everything he's entering and stuff, he's winning like 95% of stuff he's going into. But then, like, I'm thinking, what happens when he hits 25? Is he just gonna be like, yeah, man, you just uh, kind of over competing? You know, it's like nine years from now. It's a long freaking time. And yeah. I don't know. Kind of makes me wonder, like, what happens to these kids who are training full time, 16, 17 years old. It's kind of like the wrestlers, right? You see the college wrestlers and stuff. As soon as they're done, they're done. They don't get onto a mat ever again, like almost because it's like, man, I spent so much of my life already doing this. I'm over. Or like you ring yourself, you ring yourself dry of that, right? Like you spent so much time getting your ass kicked mm -hmm. and kicking ass. So like, you know, by the time Nikki's 25, he'd have spent more than half his life on the mats, right? At that point. You know, maybe he's going to want to try something different. Yeah. I I've, mean, who knows if that's going to be the case? But sure. I feel like the incentive that you're talking about earlier, the 10K. You know, I think that's what's going to keep people in the sport past maybe not 10K, but maybe 100K one day. Hopefully, those sort of things are going to keep those young guys uh, still in the sport. But that, I think that's the problem with wrestling. The same at the same time is there's no incentive in terms of like a, a career unless you're going to be a coach. Uh, it's it's kind of tough to do that for a long time, especially with wrestling specifically because it's hard on your body too. It's a lot harder. I feel it's a lot harder on your body than jiu-jitsu. Jiu yeah, for longevity. Jiu-jitsu is not that easy on your body, though, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's, let's not propagate the myth here. Everybody's like, oh, you can do jiu-jitsu until you're 70. It's like, yeah, like once a week for 30 minutes for a week. <laughs> you know, like, like, let's be honest, man. I, I, like, I'm 38 and I'm fucked. Like, my body is a mess. I know no. you've got a bunch of injuries, too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, how you deal with your injuries. Um, I don't know. Some people look at look at like Shanji Ribeiro though, like my coach Frangia. He's almost fifty years old and he goes around doing seminars like all the time. Every he's still doing jujitsu every day. This old man, he still loves it. He still competes all the time. And I mean, he had a groin injury that should have put him out the game. Like, I can't believe he even competed and dealt with that and mm -hmm. recovered from it and, and came back and still won world titles for his division and age group and stuff and. He's never really lost that, that love for it, even though it's his job. It's how he feeds his kids. You know what I'm saying? He's there every day. He doesn't seem to get sick of it. Mm. And there are those guys that don't, you know, who knows? Nick, Nicky Ryan might be that dude who never gets sick of this and, and is, grows on to become more famous than all of us. He's yeah. just collecting heels until his, into the 60s. <laughs> if That's Nicky cool, Ryan dude. puts in the miles, they're like megaton, like a megaton. Exactly, what if he's like the megaton age, guy? Yeah. He's still here <laughs> competing in every tournament, yeah. every year and stuff, man. Yeah, so it is possible, you know, and I'm sure those guys are carrying their own, like you say, physical baggage as well, the injuries and stuff. Uh, man, I mean, talking about the kids though, um, this is really interesting because, you know, it is amazing what's happening with teenagers nowadays. And it has always happened, but I think it's becoming a little bit more popular now because people are realizing that, man, if I invest a lot into these teenagers, then it's good for the for those podium pictures, right? It's, it's good for promoting their business and stuff. So, you know, people are putting a lot of emphasis on these big juvenile teams. I know that you know, we talked about Atos, right? AOJ is a huge, you know, kids team. Uh, team Lloyd Irvin has always proud, prided themselves on having this huge kids team as well. but. Man, I don't think anybody is doing kids jujitsu bigger than the United Arab Emirates. Because we were talking about this earlier, right? In Abu Dhabi and all the other Emirates as well, Dubai and Alain and all the other ones I can't even remember right now. Jujitsu is compulsory in schools. So every school child in Abu Dhabi now trains jujitsu as part of their PE class. That's How incredible. How crazy mm -hmm. is that? 
an entire country of like millions of people. This could be a rumor, but isn't there also their law enforcement is required to have a certain level law of... Law enforcement and military. Yeah, and military. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they basically just flew exactly. over like a couple of hundred Brazilian black belts and they like, you're going to teach the soldiers and you're going to teach the police and you you got the school kids. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which one I would have preferred out loud. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so cool to see, though, like when we were there last year, the, you know, just all the all the kids running off the mats, like in little geese. I've never awesome. seen so many tiny geese in my mm -hmm. life. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and just the stack of dirty geese that... Mounted oh, up to yeah, my waist. That. It was like yeah. up to my waist, and it was just kids' geese. We did a okay. we did an interview yeah. up in one of the training rooms there, in like it is the it's actually where they have the national team training, and it's this gigantic like huge hall, mm -hmm. right? Just matted from wall to wall. It's like one of those national judo centers you see on the Olympic teams. You know, it's like it's probably like what eighty feet long by like forty feet wide, like an just, airplane just, hangar. Yeah, just got space. <laughs> huge yeah. mat space. Yeah. yeah. And in the corner, it's literally like a waist-high mountain of dirty geese <laughs> waiting to be washed from the kids' classes. It's so yeah. cute. But um, I don't know, though. What do you think? Is it like a little double-edged double thing? Because it's kind of cool that kids are training. But I know when I did sports in school, I wasn't like the super athletic kid in school. I, I did sports kind of under protest. You know, I was like, I don't want to yeah. play soccer in school. Yeah. This is this sucks. Do you think there's a bunch of kids that are like, man, jiu-jitsu sucks. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, I was going to say, I think uh, <clears throat> there's worse things that would like, you know, if jiu-jitsu like took over the world, say, and was, was mandatory at every school in every country, you know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't know if that's such a bad thing. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I mean... I don't know. There should also be the option of like, you don't have to do it, but yeah, you should yeah. do something, dude. We can't have kids not doing something. Right. You know Everybody saying? needs to do some kind of physical activity. Yeah, I mean, we know how beneficial that is, right? For, for a healthy mind, healthy body. But, I mean, but you like, don't want to force jujitsu on a kid, dude. No. No. It's like piano. No way, dude. You don't want to force it's anything like on anybody. Joking. Piano and choking. <laughs> Piano movements. and wrist locks. <laughs> <laughs> Play piano or I'll choke you. <laughs> the option should be there, but you definitely shouldn't make it mandatory. Mm. But that option should be like so fun and cool that they all want to do it without being forced. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, jujitsu can be fun. You, you probably show that better than anybody, right? But jujitsu can be fun. And it should be fun. Because if it's just that horrible grind, you know, where it's just like, man, you know, embrace the grind, uh, it sucks and it's miserable. And it's like, ah, it doesn't sound very appealing to me. <laughs> I kind of like the idea of hanging out with my friends and rolling. And That's that wrestling moves. shit, man. That's that right. wrestling. Rah. Those wrestlers. Rah, head forward. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> sprawls. <laughs> it was like, was it uh, Ben Askren? Mm -hmm. I think he was on Rogan. He was talking about how he thinks like jujitsu schools are doing it wrong. Like they're not drilling their way into, into like being perfect. And I was like, well, most jujitsu schools are just kind of teaching like, kids or you know like older population like who maybe don't Dentists, have this yeah you know they, they like don't really want to be drivers. world champions yeah. they just want to like kind of hang out like maybe get some of that aggression out from traffic in the mornings. <laughs> uh, and then you know maybe learn a little bit and get a good get a good workout and that that type of mindset uh, I think I think Jeff's right it's like it comes from wrestling like yeah. you have to grind yourself into dust or it doesn't count and it's like well I yeah. think it does count actually. You're, you're a competitive athlete okay fair enough you know go down that route because probably you're not going to make it to the very very top unless you do you know have that kind sure. of mentality right because that's what everybody else is doing <laughs> if that's what they're doing you kind of need to get there but Man, for like the average guy who trains like two, three times a week, fuck no, make it fun, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't want to come in there and bust his ass for, just feel demoralized and leave and be all beat up. But what was you said to me yesterday about the, the the training thing? You want guys to be able to walk to his car without limping and stuff, right? Um, the whole thing about why uh, why uh, jujitsu like doesn't have heel hooks is because it's a business and your students need to be able to come back and the whole. Um, What's, what's easier to detect when you're about to get choked unconscious or when your ligaments are going to tear from a heel hook? You know what I'm saying? Yep. And it seems to be choking seems to be a little safer than heel hooking. <laughs> right? A little bit. <laughs> so yeah. so that, that, that argument, like, uh, do, do we want guys limping into work tomorrow, have, being like, uh, telling everybody at work, oh, my jujitsu class, this, uh, Oh, they blacked out for 30 seconds and they're, oh, you know oh oops. Yeah, that happened. I should have tapped. Yeah. yeah, you know, go... That's going to scare everybody at his work. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? You're going to scare potential students away for the teacher. So the teacher doesn't want anyone heel hooking. But then, you know, there's that other side of the argument. Dude, those are the most efficient, effective way at quickly jacking somebody up. Yeah. If you learn how to do it right. Yeah. And, it's, and there's a lot of focus that can get put onto that kind of game. So, you know, as the, as the business owner, you know, you got to balance that right. You know, which students are you going to let 
be hardcore wrestling training, get cauliflower ear, bust their ass, and which students do not mind if they just want to come in and roll? And not even the guy who just wants to pay his bill and is a punk about skipping the warm-ups. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? The guy even who sneaks in for rolling, like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, traffic. Yeah, yeah always, know, every always, time, dude. Yeah. Every I, time. You fucking know. Come on. like You just sat there in the parking lot for 20 minutes while we are doing burpees. <laughs> I love that as a coach, though. Having some guy come in late so I can talk shit to him. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, a, it's a good mix. It's a good mix. A gym should have a good mix of, of all those, you know, the kids. The kids that are all about it. The kids that are kind of forced there because they're little punks. The kids that are kind of forced there because they're little weaklings. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The, the, there should be all this. The guy who just wants to train and not compete. The guy who's all about it. You're going to have a gym with all of that going on. It's a beautiful thing. Which one were you? Hmm? You know, which one were you? Which kind of like little, little stereotype were you in that gym? Um, I was the weak kid that needed it. And then you I needed became... Needed it? Needed it, yeah. Absolutely. Um, were you bullied, Jeff? <laughs> um, I, not only was I bullied, but I would turn it around and bully other kids. Even yeah. worse. You know what I'm saying? That's so that, common, right? That happens yeah, a lot. That's like, how I did it. That's when yeah. you need it. They kind of redirect the aggression onto other people and stuff. So, yeah. and that's you rough. know, and, and that that part that part of my personality as a child has made me like I think a better person. I can kind of like check myself and be like, oh, that's. Don't punk people. Mm. You're an adult, dude. What? Even as a kid, you shouldn't be doing that shit, mm -hmm. you know? And I think uh, putting kids in jujitsu can really eliminate that behavior. I know it eliminated that. It started the process of eliminating that from my behavior, you know, when I was 16 and I met Frangia, you know? And he would actually, like, I would say some silly shit and he would actually, like, what? Hit me or some shit? You know, my mom could never hit me. <laughs> yeah, but he'd pull you out on it. Yeah, like, he would hold me down and be like, Ass whoopings were part of my life then. Like, okay. Oh, I get it. So there's the character building side of things, right? And that's one of the things that Abu Dhabi, um, the school system that they, they've been talking about as well is, you know, they've seen like, they say that they've seen, you know, improvements in concentration in classes, you know, in discipline. And let's be honest, there are, it's not an automatic, if you train jujitsu, you're going to become a better person. Because to be honest, there are some pretty shitty people out there who become even shittier because they get good at jujitsu. Well, you become a critical yeah. thinker, bro. You become a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but you, you can plan character. attacks better. Yeah. You can become, you can use the dark side. There you go. <laughs> the dark side of jujitsu. But that's heel hooking, right? Yeah. <laughs> Put it out there. <laughs> but at the same time, there is uh, an element of character building in jujitsu, I think, right? Like, would you agree? For sure. I, I would say so. I know that, you know, I, as a kid, I played, I played baseball and I ran. I was not particularly athletic. I wasn't particularly, like, physical. Um, but then once I started getting into, like, uh, CrossFit and weightlifting and doing like powerlifting and strongman and then finally into jujitsu, the the physical practice is so important to just having I think a healthy healthy day and a healthy life. That as a kid, I can only imagine how useful it is. It's not just it's not just the whole like what did you say like come on you can't do that shit and then beat someone up out of like beat it out of them right. It's also almost this idea of teaching a kid that they have control and power over it. Right, they have that control and power inside of them, and then you you exercise that willpower, mm -hmm. and that's what ends up benefiting you the most. You, as long as you're applying yourself to something, I think jujitsu is is particularly good at that because the consequences are so black and white. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I, I got armbarred, or I didn't get armbarred. Yeah. Right? It's it's very it's a very binary situation. And I know, and, like me personally as well, if I don't train jujitsu for like you know x amount of time. I start bouncing off the fucking walls. Man. Like seriously, <laughs> I get I get so like anxious and I get like I'm, I'm stressed and I get snappy and stuff. And I'm kind of like, what's wrong with me? What, what what's going on? Why am I so angry at the world? And I'm like, because I ain't choked anybody for a few days, you know. And I know that you're you you're probably like me. You're more on the highly strong end of the spectrum, Indeed. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get would a little say bit so. Of, yeah, it's yeah. the same way. If I if I spend more than a few days away from the mats, like, um, if I spend more than a few days doing nothing it becomes a nightmare. Like, I mm. need to do something. It's the way you get hungry and you get angry. Mm -hmm. I get like that after a few days and it amplifies, but it's stay, stay, staying away from the mats is the same deal. It's like... It's man, manly, like, right? Yeah. 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 It's you? like a form of emotional regulation, I guess. It's like you can kind of... Uh, for one, you can let out some aggression if you're angry driving down the road in Austin every day. I, I, sorry, I know LA is way worse than Austin. Way worse. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and in other ways, uh, I think just long term, it helps you, you know, evaluate your emotions. You kind of look at situations now more critically, and uh, when you're in a dangerous spot, being choked, 
uh, what have you, um, you can look at those things and kind of manage them slowly and progressively and you don't get too stressed out, you know, throughout your day to day. I think that's great for kids because kids, you know, they don't get that in school. You don't yeah, learn how yeah. to manage your emotions well. So no, nobody um, gets a lot of, lot of times like you can have a super intelligent kid, super smart guy, and then they go off the rails in college because they just start partying and don't know how to deal with real problems. Well, sometimes and, earlier than that, they get stuck yeah. in like special ed classes because yeah. they've got concentration problems and stuff. But it's actually, you know, just the kid needs an outlet. You Absolutely. Know, flat, in like emotional stuff that nobody gets taught on how to deal with. Mm-hmm. And it's like even you see it, right? You're walking around the world and you see so many like adults, like grown ass men and women walking around and they're just like full of this like emotional turmoil and you can see it on them a mile off. You're like, Mm -hmm. man, that person looks miserable and they're just like, you know, they're fucking horrible to people and they're just stressed all the time and it's like, because they've got no outlet, Mm -hmm. you know? It's like, and you gotta have something, whatever it is. It's hard to blame them, it's hard to blame them. It is hard to blame them. I'm not saying it's their fault, Mm -hmm. but I'm saying like, man, you know, if they had something, who knows what it could do for their character, right? Yeah. I mean, and I, then there's this always here shit about like, hey, jujitsu is character building because it gives you some discipline to like, you know, I'm not I gonna f- eat that. I feel bad for shit. the the people that are like too old or like injured or hurt to like get physical enough to do jujitsu. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's never gonna be a possibility for them. Mm-hmm. Like they're past the time that that was an outlet for them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really pity those people. Mm-hmm. Cause you see some stories about guys like, oh, they started at 60 and they got their black belt at 75 or something like that. But I mean like, that's probably like 0.000% of the population who could do that, yeah. right? And he was probably extremely healthy in his 20s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 30s. Right. Yeah. Probably did start. If he started jujitsu when he was twenty, he probably wouldn't. <laughs> probably wouldn't be able to pull that shit in his sixties. <laughs> <laughs> start something brand new. He would no, you fucked. Too late. <laughs> Stem cells. <laughs> Ooh, it sounds good. Let me get on some of that. But um, go back to Abu Dhabi. Like this weekend, uh, or this week actually, it's like ten days long. It's the Abu Dhabi. Uh, jiu-jitsu festival because it's the 10 year anniversary of world pro now world pro is like it's the parallel world championship right everybody says worlds and that's the IBJJF world championship there at the pyramid every every summer and that's that's the big one but there's like a parallel world championship and that's the Abu Dhabi UAE JGF been running now 10 years straight and this year they're going big right they got this whole like 10 day long festival and they got like kids competitions and then they got like you know like local competitions like teams and stuff and then the the whole world pro thing starts and that starts on the 24th runs through for like five days through the 28th i'm gonna be there i'm going there with will man it's gonna be wild but one thing that's really really different about world pro is they run six minute matches instead of 10 all right but it's the same points and everything but it's a six minute match and we saw this at kazai last week as well the round robin matches they're all six minutes and it's like the endless debate. We keep coming back to it, but I want to know what you guys think. So points versus sub only, six minutes versus 10 minutes. Where do you stand, sir? Uh, I actually, you know, I, I, ha- I have an appreciation for points fighting with a time limit. You know what I'm saying? You I, do? I do. I find that really exciting. I, one of my favorite games to play is, okay, what is it, a six minute match? Mm-hmm. Okay. Bullshit for five minutes. Fake attacks, fake attacks. Last minute, okay, now I'm trying to hit, make some shit happen in that last minute. That's a fun game for me to play. Mm-hmm. I enjoy that. But it's, you know, it's, a, it's a fun strategy to use. You know, but that strategy is only when there's a time limit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? The, the sub only, that changes, uh, let's change strategies. Okay, heel hook, you know what I'm saying? So I, I like mixing up strategies. And, um, you know, like personally, I love uh, points fighting under a time limit. I think it's really exciting. The takedowns, the sweeps all mean something. You know, guard passing means something. And uh, no, of course, I'm a fan of sub only. You know what I'm saying? You've I, done it? Yeah, I, done I, it, I stand right? in the <laughs> middle, dude. I stand yeah. in the middle. I'm on, I high five both teams. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing. It's like, it's, it's like you don't necessarily need to be one or the other, right? I, I think, but it's, that's the way it's going, right? There's this huge division. And uh, you've seen it as well, yeah, right? Because yeah. you train a lot of no gi and a lot of sub only mm-hmm. guys. And some of those guys really rack on points, huh? Sure, yeah. Uh, you do see, I mean, it's criticism on both sides, but um, I'm, I'm on team jujitsu as well. I, I just, I like it all. And I, I think that the, the whole the situation we're in right now with it, uh, people trying to figure it out, is, is kind of cool to watch and watch it play out. And we're like in a good time right now where we can actually witness it and be a part of kind of the, the democratic process, I guess, if you will. Yeah. So the, the points game is interesting because it, it quantifies what's mm-hmm. happening, right? Like you, you, as a viewer, 
you can very easily see, oh, this person's being dominant or this, this match is very close. Whereas, generally speaking, if you're watching like a sub-only match and there's no points, you're, you're kind of like, very, it's, it's a lot harder to say one person is, is much more dominant than the other until something dramatic happens. Like and a, it's over. And it's over, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, my biggest criticism of Saboni has always been this, is that people were ragging for so long on like the Barambolo game and the double guard pulse and the 50-50 kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, God damn it. You know, it's scissoring. People sat in their ass, you know, like just guard scooting or butt scooting, you know, dragging their ass on the ground, playing footsies and stuff. And it's like, that's like 90% of sub-only jujitsu, right? Because what do they do? Like you said, it's just they jump on each other's legs, they go for the heel hook, and they end up playing footsies. And it's like, well, what about all the other good stuff in jujitsu, like back takes and passing and, you know, attacks from mound and stuff. And it's like, man, I, I don't necessarily feel that sub-only is the automatic answer to that. It's like, it's... I asked Danaher, though. I said, like, what, what is... What for you would be the kind of, like, the perfect rule set? And he kind of did this. He kind of went... <laughs> like <that. laughs> question. You know that's a good question. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Stumped. And there was just this not an easy answer. Long uh, silence where you could kind of see him thinking. And I mean, he even said it. He's like, "There's no easy answer. There is. Mm -hmm. There isn't one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, there, there, if if you're talking like the purest form of jujitsu, no time time limit submission only mm -hmm. is kind of you know as close as you could ask for. However, it's unwatchable. You know, and it is just almost impossible to actually do. You can never run a tournament or anything like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's tough. Not to get back on an old topic, but you, you saw a witness to it at Kasai uh, where uh, I, I, have a, I kind of have a belief that, you know, jiu-jitsu, if you look at the history of it, has these peaks of different styles where uh, guys will make use of a particular style that's flashy maybe, mm. um, uh, like Baron Bolos and things like that, and, and it becomes sort of like a fad for a, a minute, oh, yeah. and then gets neutralized over time. And people start to discuss, like figure out ways to neutralize it. And uh, I think uh, Michael Perez did a great job like nullifying Craig Jones's leg lock game, although a lot of people may leg argue lock that, that so it was, hot right now. he was running away <laughs> or it was boring or whatnot, but I think he did a great job of using jiu-jitsu to you know, overcome that. And I think pe more people are going to start doing that. Yeah. And I feel like it might start, start to kind of trend out. I think, uh, think Keenan, uh, Keenan's a smart guy, man. And, you know, mm -hmm. he is like a freaking jujitsu scientist, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the way that he puts it is like, all right, something comes along and it's new, uh, but very quickly everybody learns it and it becomes assimilated into the jujitsu meta game, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just becomes. Jiu-Jitsu. It's like no longer like a phase or a fad or something new. It's just, it's a standard thing. And now you see it. You see white and blue belts, Baron Boloing, like it's no big deal, you know? And it won't be long before everybody does leg locks and everybody will be moving on to something else. I'm always that guy. I'm always like looking forward and I'm trying to predict or just really excited to see what if, what is next, you know? Because I remember when 50-50 was the thing and then Baron Bolos came along and then, oh shit, this lapel stuff. And now it's leg lock game. And it's like, what's next? Do you have any ideas or any thoughts? What would you What would you like to see next? Um, I don't know. Takedowns are fun to see, aren't they? We don't see that many anymore. You know, they've right. kind of lost their relevance, I guess, in the game. It'd be kind of cool to see a resurgence of maybe like a, a one two minute matches, a two minute match between two guys, or like a forty five second match. God dang! Let's make it a thirty minute thirty seconds. First guy to take down wins. <laughs> <laughs> First blood. Well, Thirty second I, match. There's something to be said about that because when we're talking about you know do you want you know no time limit sub only you're right it's completely unwatchable. I mean, yeah. You could spend all day just watching people butt scoot towards each other until one person makes makes a mistake right. But I think there's there's something really valuable about time limits in that it forces movement, right? It forces you to do something. Absolutely. And You're down on the clock and you know you've got 45 seconds to work. You've got to do something. You can't just hope that, that something's going to present itself, right? Yeah. And having a rule set that, that kind of like puts in windows of time that benefits more action, I think would be really interesting to see. Like, you know, Stalling. It, yeah, like here's, here's a, it's a 12 minute match, but you know the first three minutes, you know takedowns are double points, or yeah. the second three minutes, mm -hmm. guard passes are double points, and like you start forcing people to actually get into these mm -hmm. situations. That's what you want to see. You want to mm -hmm. see someone actually play jujitsu. You don't want to see someone just like lay a trap that then springs because the other person. Think about a bar fight. Right? Bar fights are no longer than a minute, 
Oh, on average, le less than right. You know it's what I'm like, saying? Brrr, however long it takes you to smash, smash a beer bottle and what was? I, I don't see any. I don't see any real realism in like a three-hour jujitsu match. You know, it's like oh, it's the purest form of combat, and it's like, but you know, combat in the real world generally lasts like 20 to 45 seconds and then it gets broken up or one guy falls over and hits his head in the curb and dies, you know? Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. that's kind of the way it goes. It's like, you watch all those street fight videos and stuff and, you know, people are getting hard-ons about, oh, look, it's some jujitsu in a street fight and stuff. And it's like, yeah, the guy gets mounted and immediately gets dragged off him, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, you never see any of that, like, long, patient kind of working towards a thing. It's just... Yeah. It's You're bullshit. talking about unskilled folks as well, but, you know, I mean... <laughs> you watch any tough man competition, you'll see the same thing, too. It's, yeah. You know, back in the day. 100%. But, but I don't know if jiu-jitsu tournaments should turn into, like, world star hip-hop style. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they mean? should. Like, yes, should they it should. really end up being that? Like, <laughs> just one shitty judo hip toss and, I'm starting, and things over? I'm starting to world star though, JJ right now. Flow <laughs> grappling! Seriously, you've got, like, a bunch of people on the sidelines jumping up and down filming with their phone in vertical <laughs> mode. We're halfway there. We're over halfway there. It's like <laughs> Send us your content. We will put it on our site. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I, I love... I love the, you know, entertaining matches, and I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, as you proved, it's more about the practitioner than the rule set, right? Because, honestly, Jeff, I mean, you know, you competed pretty much everything in your day, right? Gi no gi, point sub only, ADCC, IBJJF, you name it, and, uh, you know, it, it's, your, it's your responsibility to make it a good match, not the, not the points, right? Yeah, you said it. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Which do you prefer, though, personally? Like you mentioned about points, but if you if you had the opportunity to kind of take a match tomorrow, like if, is this something which you prefer over another? Um, <clears throat> I really enjoyed. I've, I've said this a lot of times. I've really I really enjoyed the tournament Henner and Heat on. Actually, I think their dad did it. Um, it was called the IG JJF, and they did first person to twelve points. Ooh, like a tech fall. Yeah, they did tech fall. Ooh. And. Um, and it was great, dude. It was really fun tournament. I did it for we did it two. I did it three years. Pur blue, purple, and brown. And I really got to showcase my game and my style under those rules. Um, there was there was some weird parts of the rules. They had like a coin flip thing I thought was whack. Hmm. And if you like three minutes on bottom, you'd switch. They they changed. They messed around with it. But I like yeah. the, the 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 underlining principle of it was if you got to 12 points before the other guy, you won, match was over. Man, but what, was there a time limit? They, they switched it, the first year there was no time limit matches. Oh, just all first of, to like, 12 did, Like submission. all white belt to black belt, they did a whole tournament like this. Oh my God, Damn. and it's still going on right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Solo had like a, a, a half hour match with uh, Fabio Leopoldo. Wow. At there, and then um, it was great, it was the, it was the year, um, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but Hiron slammed, he probably doesn't want me talking about this, he slammed Cameron Earl Cameron on his dome Earl, piece and yeah, knocked him out. Yeah, that's right, yeah, Yo, yeah, me yeah. and Bill Cooper were right there, like, dude, you just, mm. dunked, oh, shit. He picked him up from close guard and just dumped him and knocked him out. Right, Ooh. dude, we, right. I was sitting front row on that, and I saw him turn his head over and start twitching and shit. Uh, wow. I was like, damn, he knocked him out. Oh, the a lot. <laughs> so they eliminated that because they were allowing slams from the guard, mm. you know, so they took that out. <laughs> So the year, the, the best year, I forget what it was, it was like first to 12 with a half hour time limit on each match. The average match was like five minutes and right. dudes would quit. The, 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 like, the, the concept of like, what? Like a match could go more than like four or five minutes would freak dudes out. Mm -hmm. They get scared, like I don't have the cardio for that. They would quit, they, they would quit and like expose something fast. Wow. Because they just mentally broke down. You know, I like I like the idea of getting to a certain points and, and like that's it, like a tech fall though. Because I, I mean, you know, it's possible to kind of get a, a fast submission sometimes, you know, like a guy can dive on it and stuff. But um, if a guy just kind of clams up and he's like, no, nah, I ain't giving you shit. It's like, you could still score those points pretty quick, right? Yeah, I could be socking you in the, in the face. You, you could, I mean, that's the realistic element. But if a guy is just gonna go like, okay, sub only, I ain't gonna give you shit, I'm just gonna like bottom side control, my elbows in, tucked here and just stay there. And it's like, all right, I can jump from knee right, I can go to side, I can spin the mount, I can roll you over and take you back, that's my 12 points right there, boom, I'm out of here. Next match, let's go. So let's build, help me, I wanna do a tournament, I wanna call it 10 or tap. 10 or tap, 10 points or tap. Because mm. 10 points is not that much, two for a takedown, three for a guard pass, 
uh, you know, say fourth amount, boom, that's like nine points right that's there. Nine points right there, and you're right? shot with something. I almost got that math wrong. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not actually like eleven like, points ooh. right now. So. <laughs> Confident with that math, you know, throwing them out there. <laughs> Just throwing a number out there, hoping it's right. <laughs> But yeah, no, a, I, I love that idea because a guy could go out there and he could win in like, boom, let's say 45 seconds and he'd be and, and is super this, fresh for his next match. And is this 10 point spread or just first to 10? First to 10. Okay. First to 10, okay. right. Race. Not a differential. Right, not like, race to yeah. 10. It's not 10-0. Like, yeah. I mean, you see it in wrestling and a lot. I've seen that, you know, I've been to like wrestling tournaments where a guy gets a tech fall and like the- Because then it's the like 10-8 and you're awesome. scrambling Dude, it out trying to- Bill Cooper had a great match under these rules with a guy named Mike Weaver, who was, uh, he's a black belt from, um, the Half Gracie up in Northern California. Really tough guy, really tough guy. Um, Bill actually exhausted the guy because I, I fought the dude in the finals of the Purple Belt Absolute and got a choke on him because he was beat up from this 27 minute match with Bill Cooper Holy where, crap. where sweeps, <laughs> sweeps were one point. Huh? Okay, and they went 11 to 12 was the score on this match. Wow. Each, each point was scored a sweep, a sweep, a sweep for sweep. A sweep for sweep for 27 minutes, oh hard work, sweeps that were not given up, uh -huh. where they both grinded them out. Wow, oh, 27 minutes, and then finally he got 12, Bill had 11, and like the whole audience, everyone was just like, it was the greatest match, and that those rules promote mm -hmm. really exciting matches that can happen, you know? And yeah, and, uh, yeah that was a good example of, of what you just said. Yeah, because it's like a sweep per minute. Yeah. Almost, I mean, if my man's right, yeah, on yeah. each side, yeah. That's but I mean, awesome. e e <laughs> even though with like the points in jujitsu and, and you know, you can get like four points for major positions and stuff, even in a 10 minute jujitsu match, you really see points go to double figures, right? Mm -hmm. Usually matches are decided like, you know, three nothing or like four, four two, two yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So it is hard freaking work to get the 12 points, but I think if you had that, if you knew that you could win by racking up those points, you would see guys move. You wouldn't yeah. just get a guy chilling out in yeah. side control. Well, let's get this over with, dude. I got next right. round to get to. And exactly. it'd be like a basics revival, I feel like. Because yeah. you're not going to play as much, you know, open guard, flashy. Kind of, Mount, you're gonna, yeah. those four. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like That's that. Cool. Or you could do a Black Panther style where the... the the, you Come on. in the movie? Throw them, Go on. Yeah. Where like, yeah. they, they like, they get closer and closer, like they force them into a smaller and smaller area <laughs> oh, that's and as the fight goes on. So like Some guys just come around, minute, they just pick the mats yeah, up until they're all like minute, on a two by The yeah. mats are done until they're just like standing Stuck on one, on the four by table. four. <laughs> you see that movie Toy with Robin Williams? Yeah. You guys ever seen that where he's in that room and they're just like, the, the walls, walls are coming, coming in. in. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's a way to promote action. It's like, you ain't getting out of here. <laughs> and if neither of you submit, you both get crushed. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I, well, the rules thing, we could just go on and on. But I found this really cool because uh, we were talking earlier about the, um, like the prize money and stuff, a lot on the line, 10 Gs for a, for a single match and stuff. But you mentioned to me yesterday about uh, a super fight you got offered real quick, and it's probably the most unique prize for a uh, super fight I ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. Um I forget who's doing it. Some rapper guy, I think. Be real from uh, Cypress Hill. Cypress Hill, like <laughs> his, he, he's sponsoring it through his cousin. Something, yada yada yada. Anyway, I'm fighting for a pound of weed. <laughs> that is a lot of weed. <laughs> so it's supposed to be pretty big, man. I don't know. Like I just all like it was just like I was like text message or uh, e uh, what do you call it? Instagram. I'm like, what? Jeff, we want you to do a super fight for a pound of weed. Eddie Bravo's the host, or Eddie Bravo's the ref. <laughs> um, of course, it had to be. Who else could it be? I mean, yeah, I don't so. know the going rates, but it sounds like a pretty good cash prize, at least, if anything else. A pound, <laughs> a pound of weed, depending on how, what kind of weed it is, can run from like 2K to right. 4K. Right. Damn. Yeah. So that's a great <clears throat> wow. question. Is like, how long would that last you, though? Because you ain't selling it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sell drugs. I would never sell weed. <laughs> no, are you getting its personal use? But how no, long yeah. would it last? I'm the last person to sell weed. Like what? Like, <laughs> Months? Um, I sh I would share my weed with any you know. That's a lot of weed. <laughs> it's a lot of weed. Yeah. A lot of I get, weed, but man. but you get you get bored of the same, the same smoke, the same kind of weed over and over again. So, I don't know. So you spread it over like a year, like rotate through. 
Mm. Keep some in the, the yeah. I would need some stash. time to think about this. Yeah. <laughs> Do the math. Yeah. Most people know how they're going to spend their prize money already. That's re that's. Re I feel like is it is it really responsible of you or is it irresponsible <laughs> of you that you don't know how you're going to spend your prize? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that's that's a pretty unique special. one, man. Uh, did you say that Wiz Khalifa had something to do with it as well? I think. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. You could uh -huh. look it up. You guys could look it up right now on your phone. It's it's called High Rollers. High Rollers. Of course. And it's it's in <laughs> L.A. It's actually in L.A. on June 10th, and I'm fighting. Um, Are they still taking registration? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's interested. Yeah. Man, they had to recently awesome. though. They actually had like um, man, I can't remember what it was called, like a Wii Games or the Marijuana Games or something. And it's basically like a kind of a a big multi-sport, multi-day event where they have like you know. Kind of board sports and BMX and B boys, and they had some grappling matches there as well. And it's like, you know, it's kind of like the the weak culture. It's like, you know, uh, let's kind of break away from that whole like, you know, stoners are dumb, wasters kind of stereotype because a lot of people use weed for various reasons, right? And man, it's let's be honest, it's pretty big in the jujitsu community, right? Yeah. It's like Naga meets the Cannabis Cup. It's pretty cool. you, yeah, kind of, like, yeah. something like that, yeah. Like that. But you can't, uh, you can't say that stoners are, are like, you know, slow or dumb anymore because if you say that, someone who's high might heel hook you and then you're fucked. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but I mean, like, speaking of the weed thing as well, you know, one thing that's really, really big in jujitsu lately is the whole CBD as well, right? You guys using that? The topical, like CBD oil or like that? All that. Uh, yeah. The oil, All that. you drink Tincture. it. Yeah, there's there's a guy selling yeah. honey uh, here in Austin. Yeah. CBD, CBD honey. infused honey? It was delicious. Really? Yeah. I used the tincture. I used to, I got one of those little bottles with like the, uh, the kind of the pipette. Uh, I kind of like drop it under my tongue, a mm -hmm. couple yeah. of drops of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, uh, I first tried it last year because we were in Vegas for Masters Worlds, right? And the year before we went to Vegas and the dispensaries, you could only get anything at all from a dispensary if you had state ID. Mm. And of course, you didn't have state ID. And then since then, they opened it. So it's a free-for-all now. You can go to any dispensary in Las Vegas and you don't need any kind of ID. You can buy whatever you want. So I came out of there with like a handful of these mini disposable vape pens. They're just pure, C uh, pure CBD. No THC whatsoever, no high, sure. just the CBD. And got a couple of bottles of the, the tincture as well. Man, at first I was like, you know, I have a lot of pain from jujitsu, right? Like just generally, like my joint fingers pain. are jack joint joints, my feet and my ankles, emotional my neck. Pain. I'm pretty good on that <laughs> side of things, but you know, I'm just banged up. I'm 38 and I've been doing this for a long time. And I was like, after a while, I'm like, I don't feel my ankles hurting anymore. Like I don't, I can walk without pain. What's what's going on? And I was like, man, is that just a placebo? Am I like, like, is this something else? And then I stopped taking it for a little while, and I was like, oh, no, no, holy shit, this is for real. It is absolutely, seriously super good for information and stuff. And, you know, I'm not a weed smoker at all, but I 100% say that CBD is the real, it's the real shit. That's the best case scenario, right? You, yeah. you find something that actually helps yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. without, without any sort of real negative, um, you know, side mm -hmm. effects, I guess. Mm -hmm. I just got a bottle recently. I got um, Fight to Win, one of our live events. You know, you fought Fight to Win a couple of times. One mm -hmm. of their uh, advertisers, stroke sponsors, is a CBD company, and they've even got a discount code. So, you know, if you're watching the live broadcast, you can actually see they actually flash it up on screen. You get 10% off. And I was like, watching it one day, and I was like, <laughs> it's just <laughs> around to my computer. I'm like sticking that code up. I'm like, yes, all right. Yeah. The Shit unfortunate part is real. there's not a you know there's not a lot of research on it, so it's kind of hard unless you have a you know a anecdote for it. You, it's hard to know. So um, you can only at this stage you can only go off the feel, right? It right. Feels good. Feels good, man. Mm -hmm. Gotta go with it. And it's but. just unfortunate, I think, that people can't get that because there's not enough research on it because oh, it's a scheduled it, drug. Yeah, so. I mean, bullshit. But I managed to get the CBD on mail order, and that was fine. Like so. Yeah. But what about you, Jeff? Because I mean, I know you're a you're a pretty, you know, heavy user, but is it just, is it about the high or is it about the, the, the therapeutic aspects as well or what? Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of, it's a big culture in, in California. You know, I, I've, I've grown up between LA, San Diego and Santa Barbara, and that's all just, you know, marijuana capital. And it's been a part of my life since I was a kid. It's like everywhere, you know, you grow up as a kid and, there's that cigarette smoke that my that that I'm used to that I see everyone smoking out in the public mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll run up and hug one of my uncles and they burn me with their damn cigarette. Yeah. There's that, <laughs> yeah. and then there's that other one that's like really weird and kind of like <laughs> kind of like enticing. 
I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Pepe but, Le Pew and Tyson. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've, I've been around it a lot. And I'll tell you what, CBD is being sold at like health food stores, mm -hmm. right? Little shots. They, they sell these shots. You can get a turmeric, ginger, lemon mixed with cayenne pepper and infused with CBD. And, and it's like eight bucks, five yeah. to eight bucks for a little shot of this shit. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I take them every other day and my joints feel great. And I'm also like you, I've dealt with a lot of joint pain more than anything. Mm -hmm. Emotional. No more. Um, <laughs> that, that might just be me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of emotional pain. Right. I'm, down, I'm down to... <laughs> but for sure though, like, like I know you were saying a lot about, you used to have a lot of problems with your hands, with yeah, your neck yeah, and everything. Yeah, yep. and that's, that's, that's common for a lot of like heavy gi players, right? A lot yep. of the spiders, you know, man, like I, I need to look after my hands, you know, yeah. these tools are my trade. And yeah. if I fuck these up and so, you know, I don't want early onset arthritis. And if that, me. Yeah, if that helps and, and it does help, it really does. I'm not just making that up. Yeah, so CBD, um, love it. Um, herbs are for the healing, brah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I'm, I have no problems with marijuana. I'm not trying to like encourage it onto kids, but I don't think there should be a problem with marijuana. Two main topics of this podcast. Drop out of school, smoke weed. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> totally, no. <laughs> that's, what I, that's, I, that's, I that's what I got. That's what I got. <laughs> well, what about rolling high? Because, uh, you know, there's like, Eddie was probably the first guy to come out in the jujitsu community, right? Eddie Bravo was, he came out with this book, like, you know, um, I think it was Master in the Rubber Guard, or, or, or possibly, I, I forget which one exactly, but, you know, he had like a whole chapter and a forward from Joe Rogan dedicated to rolling high, and, and he was the first guy to come out. Man, he got slammed, right? People were like, oh, it's wrong. You shouldn't be promoting this in the jujitsu community. You know, you're a bad influence and stuff. And he just straight up said, man, I fucking roll when I high. You know, and he's not the only one. Look at the Diaz brothers, man. Those guys, you know, crawl. The real Americans, baby. If they want, <laughs> do what they do. That's, that's the American spirit, isn't it? Do yeah. what you want. That, preach, like, what? I, what? You're going to tell me what I can smoke when yep. it's proven to, like, be safe and heal people? Shut up. I know it's a law, but I also know a bullshit law when I hear one. Mm-hmm. And what about rolling when you're high, though? Because, like, a lot of guys, they actually say, oh, it helps my jujitsu. I mean, is that true? Or do they just really like getting high? <laughs> they just really like getting high, and that's okay, <laughs> right? What's wrong with that? There's there nothing is nothing wrong with that. Wrong with that. But I, I'm not going to name names because these guys don't want to be named. Uh, but I was with two pretty high-level black belts, and the one guy was like, yeah, dude, I smoke, and it makes, helps my jujitsu. And the other one was like, shut the fuck up. You just like to get high. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. Well, there's a responsible use and there's, I mean, just like anything, there's there's a good way and a bad way to use it, right? Oh, yeah. And I think I think everyone has had, at least I know I have, had training partners like, you know, I'm like rolling with somebody. I'm like, what is wrong with you right now? Like, oh, right. Like, yeah. pay attention. Like, we're doing this. <laughs> this is what we're doing right now. Yeah. Like, what's the going on? The guy hit it a bit too hard. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, uh, th there's a big difference between like, okay, yeah, like it loosens me up and it kind of opens up like mm -hmm. my creative ways of, of dealing with different problems. And there's like, you're a zombie. Mm -hmm. I'm just dealing with like a limp. I might as well just be rolling with, you know, a bag, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> some people are weird though, man. Some people yeah. are, and that's why they're in jujitsu. I know dudes that come in high as shit, don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. They don't want to pay attention either. They just want to fucking roll. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? They pay their bill. I'm not going to try to like take the weirdness out of this dude. I'm like, okay, you want to be weird, Mr. Antisocial guy? Cool. I kind of want to talk shit to you about it, but... It's not my place. I'm also a weirdo. <laughs> you know, I, I have my times where I don't want to talk to anybody, and I'm just like, listen, I've paid attention to all kinds of shit today. I'm not here to pay attention. You know? Yeah. Like, I kind of, I kind of, I really empathy. like that. I have empathy for those dudes that are like that, because, you know, there's times you want to be alone, but I still enjoy rolling, damn it. And I have to deal with people to get that fun I want. <laughs> 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 I like that. I like that idea. I'm not going to take the weird out of you. Just, well, right. let's lean into the weird. It's cool. We can <laughs> all be weird together. It's one of the things I love about jujitsu, though. It's like, seriously, dude, it's like, you can be as weird as you like. And, you know, it doesn't actually stop your ability to be good at jujitsu, you know? Sometimes it helps. Sometimes uh, it does help, <laughs> man. There are some really fucking weird guys out there as well in jujitsu. And sometimes they're like the guys who just see things that regular people don't, you know? They have a different a different perspective or they just spend all their time thinking about it in a certain way in a darkened room. I don't fucking know, but <laughs> for real. Mm -hmm. So what's next for Jeff Glover, man? Like what's, what you got going on? Um, man, a lot, a lot. Thank you for asking. Um, doing some filming with you guys, you know, 
getting to know the Flow Grappling crew. Um, it's, been awesome. awesome. it's been awesome having you out here, man. We Thank did you. an episode of the Laundromat yesterday. We shot yeah. that. That'll be coming out pretty soon. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm going to do some techniques later. But mm -hmm. what about you in general? I mean, like, you got your school over there, right? Goodland Jiu-Jitsu. That's right. Goodland. Um, Bill and I were having a discussion one day, Bill Cooper. And he was like, you know, he gets going on his little tangents. And he was like, son, son. We call each other son, son. He goes, son, son. Son, son. We got it from Mayhem Miller. Son, son. <laughs> it's like you call somebody son, but you double it up. Son, son. Son, son. So when, he has, when, he, when he has, like, an idea, it starts with son, son. <laughs> so he's like, Sansan, jujitsu's good. And it's not ground fighting, it's land fighting. <laughs> okay. We should call our place Good Land. I was like, damn it, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> damn it, Bill. <laughs> that is genius. <laughs> Jit thought Goodland was like the town or something where you guys were based. I thought you just open it, uh, Goodland Jiu Jitsu, you know, uh, like Oakland Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> just when I thought you couldn't get any better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the city is Goleta, California. Goleta. Goleta. Okay. Yeah. Where is that? Uh, it's adjacent to Santa Barbara. Oh, okay, cool. So if guys want to check you out, they can head over. Yes, Goodland Jiu Jitsu, um, Goleta, California. Come by. Nice. And what else is going uh, on? Yeah, right? seminars. I just filmed some DVDs with uh, Budo videos. Um, Break a Leg is my leg lock DVD. And then Sweep Dreams is the, the DVD all about sweeps. And um, Got a tour coming up? I'm going to go to England. Yeah, that's nice. right. In September. Thank you. I'm going to England for 15 days and doing a tour of as many jiu-jitsu schools as I can. And I was uh, really welcomed with open arms when I when I announced it like everyone wanted to have me at their school so you've been before right I have yeah, yeah in, in 2011 I oh you did Manchester. ADCC yeah oh right of course and yeah. then you did some seminars when you were there before yeah you so. travel a lot with that kind of stuff right yeah very you know I'm one of the jiu-jitsu guys that's been able to go all around the world traveling for free on other people's dime so very fortunate on that one yeah Where's the coolest place that you've been to kind of like teach and train and hang out and stuff? Is there anywhere that stands out? It's been a particularly memorable place. Uh, in, um, I forget what year it was, but a buddy of mine took me to Mexico with him on uh, one of his vacations. Really rich guy wanted me to hang out with him. And uh, we were wrestling in his uh, pool. I put him in a guillotine. Long story short, the dude's eardrum pops. We're supposed to be on a plane the next day. So he can't get that shit. He can't. He couldn't. No. So, you know, he extends our trip another week. We end up finding a gym to train at. Um, it was on the third story of this building in Mexico in um, Cancun area. Mm. And, guys, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It was a 360-degree view. It was about the size of this room that we're in. 360-degree glass surrounding open sli uh, doors, that sliding glass doors to come in. And on, uh, it was like... The highest building, and all you could see was the jungle. Oh, I mean, you could whoa. see the little city, but you could see the jungle. You know, like it was just tranquil and stuck in my head. Yeah, yeah. that sounds like a good one. Yeah. And some creepy jungle man just watching you through all your windows, studying, <laughs> foot, studying <laughs> your stuff. <laughs> foot. How about you, Tony? You've traveled quite a bit. Where's the coolest place you've uh, visited and trained? Man, uh, so Abu Dhabi was a really fun trip. Yeah, uh, I think that place is is it's a. I mean, it's pretty visually, wild. it's amazing. Yeah. Um, the people there are genuine, nice. I liked, uh, I liked the culture there. It was great. Uh, different, for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're a culture shock type, it would <laughs> definitely be a culture shock. Yeah. Um, but I like the kind of the rough times. I kind of I, I, those are the ones I remember the most, I guess. So mm -hmm. I really loved uh, Russia, uh, Krasnoyarsk, Russia, uh, and like Colombia. But those are like two extremes, right? You got the severe heat and then the severe cold, but. Yeah, I remember Any, the photo you posted. You were in Siberia, right? Yeah, it was crazy. In the Arsk. middle of winter. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. <laughs> in the middle of the winter in the frozen tundra. And, I mean, I've been with you to Colombia, and that was not a, not a fun trip. You yeah. know, people... Yeah. Uh, they, what was they, up with that? People love to... It? Well, it, <laughs> it, was just, it was just pretty wild. Like, the entire thing was pretty, pretty nuts. We had, we had we, issues with the, with the event that we were mm -hmm. there for. And well, it was plus 90 plus up to 100 and some odd yeah, really uh, degrees. Hot and really humid. Humidity was always 100 percent. And then uh, the hotel we oh. stayed at smelled like fish. The <laughs> AC was you could not control the AC, so they controlled it for you, which oh means it was never on. It was like a, <laughs> was like a towel yeah. ration. Also, yeah. was, towel oh, there's a towel, like a towel ration. ration. Like uh, you had to go downstairs and get your towel if you wanted a new towel, and uh, they were always out. 
Um, so <laughs> no towels for you. We were there for nine days. <laughs> I ended up stockpiling three one day, and we used those for pretty much the rest of the week. Um, nice. So we were there for what seven, eight days. It's kind of yeah. like that with bottled water in Abu Dhabi. Actually, like I went to the restaurant once, and I was like, "Can I get a bottle of water?" And the guy's like, "No, you can have a cup." And the cup was like that big, and he get this like three liter bottle of water, and he kind of like pours me the cup, and he's like, "There you are," and I was like, "Motherfucker." I I want a bottle of water. I want to take it out of my room and I want to drink a bottle of water. And I just went over to the fridge and I'm like, they've got all these like huge bottles of water, right? And I just grabbed one and he's like chasing me out of the restaurant like I just stole a fucking thousand dollar bottle of champagne. And he's like, no, 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 sir, no, no. I'm like, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And like, I, just, I just fucked off with this bottle. And I realized that even a bottle like this big is like six bucks. Oh my god! And I did actually just jack like a forty dollar bottle of water. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it's a precious commodity out there, right? Crazy. Wow. But yeah. I was going to train later, you know, because like every time we go for World Pro, which I'm going for next year, uh, next week. Sorry, I fly on Saturday. Um, we always train because there's not a lot else to do, you know. We we go there, we cover the tournament, and then we go and we do some work and. We're like, man, got to train, right? You've been watching jujitsu all day. Let's roll. Got to get and it out. Got to get it out. So, yeah. you know, the other good thing is we always stay in a hotel and there's always a ton of athletes and a ton of black belts and the referees and everybody. And they have like, they take some meeting rooms and they just put some mats down. So like last year, I was rolling with some kids from AOJ, a guy called Zach Naminsky and another guy called Liam Moss, a purple and a black belt now. And, um, you know, the year before I was rolling with some like, uh, some random like purple belt girl from Belgium, you know, and, and then wow. just like some guys from Japan and guys from the UK. And it was like, it was pretty cool. Yeah. But man, like you're going to go and train in an environment like that. You need to drink a lot of water. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to jack that water. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I know exactly where that bridge well, is. <laughs> see, and so even in, in Colombia, the, the bag, the water is in plastic bags. Bags. Yeah, yes. Bags of water. And it's never cold. How's it's, that and for it's, weird? It's, it's typically fair. in a, uh, a sludge of water that's being uh, grabbed into by athletes that are but not washing their hands every Just five minutes. The way that you uh, we'll say that. the way that you drink it is you literally take the bag and you tear the corner yeah. and then you like squeeze Suck a bag out. of water <laughs> into your mouth. Yeah. Delicious. That yeah. sounds great. So your one mm. form of hydration has like cholera. <laughs> everyone's, everyone's germs all over. <laughs> Dysentery. Did yeah. you train when we were in Iceland? We went. Tony and I went to Iceland earlier this year. Yeah. Did you go to Mjolnir? Yeah, I went to place? yeah Mjolnir. Uh, yeah. Mjolnir. Mjolnir. Bunch of Vikings Mjolnir, yeah. in there, man. Just yeah. massive. Mjolnir. Tall, it's, 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 it's attractive. Hammer. Hammer, right? yes. It's the name of the gym. So yeah. yeah. They yeah. all have yeah, horns. They all have horns. Yes. Yeah. That. These kind what of shoes? <laughs> they <wear those? laughs> pretty close. Yeah. So Except they're made, of, they're made of leather. They were, they were like wild leather Reindeer products. Leather. Yeah. Reindeer leather <laughs> yes. products. And, uh, and uh, you puff, it, puff and skin. Yeah. You trained it? Puff, yes. You did? What was yeah. it like? It was great. It was yeah. great. Yeah. There's not uh, a lot else to do in Iceland. No, but the, man, the facility was beautiful. It was like a castle atop a hill. Uh, it was, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, That's so strange. I'm driving. You don't even see it from the road. It's so high up. Uh, like you're, you're driving in, you have to take a windy road that goes around, and then you see it around the other side. Uh, but there's no roads on the other side, so it's all. It's like right there on the coast. So that yeah. sounds awesome. Yeah. I did actually train with those guys. I visited Reykjavik a long time ago and it was before they even had opened like mm -hmm. any of because they they've gone to like three or four gyms in the past like 10 years and each time they just expand and it's like it's not even like a gym anymore it's like a resort right <laughs> yeah because they've just got like a barber shop and like this you know like uh they've got all the, the strength conditioning crossfit gym and they got the mat and the mma and mm -hmm. oh, it's incredible what those guys are doing up there and you know awesome. the other thing that's crazy about that gym it's non-profit is it really it's a non-profit gym yeah, it's run by like a board of directors and they basically every single penny or cent or whatever they call it there uh, just gets redirected straight back into the business. And that's why they've been able to keep growing and growing and growing. Because mm -hmm. all those guys who actually run it, they all have day jobs. And you know, salaries are pretty good in Iceland as well, so they don't mm -hmm. need to make money. Sixty dollar drop in fee probably. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? No, but yeah. I mean, hey, sounds like a pretty cool, cool place no, to visit. Yeah. How about yeah. you, Armin? You know, I, I, as much as I've been lucky to travel for work, I've never gotten a chance to, to roll overseas. No way. Yeah. It's even when we went to London for uh, the, Grand Slam. The, the Grand Slam, the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam, I, I wasn't able to, to actually train. Just too busy in and out? Just, yeah, it was, it was always just too crazy. Yeah. Uh, all my trips I always cut very short. And I, mm. I even, usually in the middle of the trip, I'm like, why did I fly in last minute and leave first thing? Like, why don't I give myself any any breathing room here, but 
unfortunately, I just haven't been able to get on the mats with uh, overseas. Next time. Yeah. Next time. Yeah. Next time for sure. It's kind of like um, it's very similar here. You just, there's like a mat. <laughs> 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 you like shake hands. And, <laughs> and then a child beats me up, right? That's usually <laughs> yeah. so. It's very similar to what happens here. Also, <laughs> awesome, man. No, it, it was. Oh, I'll tell you an interesting little aside from the yeah. uh, the story with. Gunner, uh, Milner, is that how you pronounce it? Milner. 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 So just uh, people ask me all the time, I, I bought a rash guard from there and they're like, how do you pronounce, and I always get it wrong anyway, so Milner. Uh, but uh, we get there and he's speaking uh, Icelandic to, to these folks and, uh, and then he looks around in, in English and he goes, is anyone here only speaking or not speak? Uh, and I, I was the only one that raised my hand. The rest of the class he did it in English. No. I felt like such a dick. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty polite. Very polite. I wanted to just be like, no, I'll watch. It's fine. I'll, right. I'll, yeah, but. Man, I... Uh, Your I'm, English sucks. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I met Gunnar, uh, Gunnar Nelson, for the first time when he was 16 years old. And he was like, just got his blue belt. And the no kid was shit. already super, super good. And um, I used to live in Manchester at the time in the UK. And uh, he used to come. He used to come and stay with us for like three, four weeks, a month sometimes. And he used to come and train with us. And then he'd go with Ireland and train with John Kavanagh there. Because I trained at a straight blast gym, one of the straight blast gyms in, in one of the main ones in Europe. So they have one in Manchester and one in Dublin and then a bunch of affiliates, right? And he used to come and train with us. And he'd go and train with John. And he'd go back to Iceland. And he went and trained in like Hawaii with BJ Penn. And he went to other places around the state. And man, the, the progress on that kid, like going back to the whole teenagers thing, just incredible. Like he would, he would come and train with us, 16 year old blue belt, like, Kid's good. Go off, like three months later, he came back and he's like, okay, now he's 17 and he's like purple belt and he's killing everybody. <laughs> and then he'd come back in and he'd like, you know, a year later he's a brown belt and nobody can even score a point on him. And it was just like, holy shit. And you know, eventually he, uh, he went Henzo's, right? He got his black belt from Henzo's. And um, I, John Danaher told me a story because um, we, were, we were chatting about Gunner and about how when he came to Henzo's, he was still a brown belt. And he just has the most savage rear naked choke you've ever seen. Like, since he was a blue belt, he was just a magician that get in the back and choke anybody and everybody. Just had this incredible crush. And he went to Henzo's and everybody got really, really, really pissed off with him because he came in there and they're like, who the fuck is this kid? Rear naked <laughs> choking everybody. And then they're actually like, okay, you know, you're cool. You're one of us now. But he, he man, people were mad. Like, uh, he is fucking, he's a, he was a phenomenon in jiu-jitsu and actually it's a kind of a shame that he went into UFC. He always wanted to do MMA, but I'm like, God damn it, it's like if one of the good guys we lost, he could have stuck around and yeah. competed <laughs> in the gi and stuff. Yeah. He competed in the gi and he had an amazing match, I think it was Clark uh, in brown belt pants. Like, uh, man, this is going back now, probably 2010 or something like that. Wow. But yeah, it was, um, yeah, he was good. He was really good. And of course, he had that breakout 20, 2009 ADCC when he fought Jeff Monson. And oh, uh, yeah. freaking dude, I mean, yeah, Jeff, right. Jeff, goddamn Monson. Didn't he pick him up or something? Didn't he pick Monson up or some shit? No, but he got his back. Got and his he back. almost finished him with a Kimura right at the end. But I mean, that was when Jeff, Mon could, Jeff Monson could still walk, you know? Because right. like, he's like a broken down husk now, man. right? He's beat up and stuff. But Shout out to Jeff. I love Jeff Monson. Yeah, just the man. man. He is, but yeah. holy shit, dude, that guy is just. Uh, Man, there's a lot of miles on the clock. Right? Heal, mm -hmm. Jeff. Heal. <laughs> yeah. Need some CBD. That's Need what he CBD, needs. Jeff. Hit me up. Can watch, they get CBD in Russia? Because he lives the... there now, right? <laughs> Does he? So I don't know if you're going to bring this up, but I want to. What? Dick moves. Dick moves. Yes, we talked about it last time. And I thought it was a we good did. conversation. We did. Last time but... Tony was on the podcast, we talked about dick moves in jiu-jitsu. We were talking mm. about uh, what are dick moves. Do you have... Uh, you have any thoughts on that matter, Jeff? Knee on the throat comes to mind. Knee on throat. I like knee on throat. Jury <laughs> <laughs> um, says you're a dick. Yeah. Actually, knee on skull more like. I kind of put it more on the kind of the jaw than the throat. It's a little rough. Uh, it is. It is. But like Reed said it last week. He's like, well, you know what? You kind of, you pass my guard. You kind of earned the right to fuck me up. You know? So it's yeah. my fault for letting you get there. But That's true. I, I don't bust it out with everybody, though. I yeah. just say. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like choking somebody's mouth, mm -hmm. you know, or like twisting their head and turning into a crank. Mm -hmm. I could do that to anybody I take their back on, mm -hmm. you know, but I hardly ever do it. Because it's not a nice thing Bow and arrow with the lapel across Aww, the mouth. Yeah, cool. that's a, let's keep it clean. Let's keep it clean, move. everybody. Stop, yeah. stop being dicks to each other. <laughs> uh, what about stink? Yeah. I love that one. And especially if they're trying to talk to their coach or, <laughs> you know, right there while you're nice. rolling with them. I've literally never even thought about 
actually I did that. Yeah, somebody. I've done quite that. Yeah. Shh. <laughs> to the, go up to their coach and just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, excuse me, I'm busy here. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. he tried to respond back to his coach. I, uh, yes, sir. Like going for. Him. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> My first time I ever saw anybody do that was with BJ Penn, the UFC. Many, Stinky many palm, many dude. Years ago, yeah. you know, and he kind of does that and pops mm-hmm. straight underneath the mouth. The funniest thing I ever saw was this. Um, it's back when I was a blue belt and me and a bunch of guys from my team, we ended some competition and we didn't know what the fuck we were doing back then because there weren't that many competitions. So we're kind of making up as we go along. We're all hoist Gracie blue belts. It's like, you get a blue belt, you get a blue belt, you know, mm. from a seminar. And we just went and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it was like. And we went to this uh, Nogi tournament and um, it was no point submission only. It was like, just like a round robin, everybody fight each other. But it was like, you know, with time limits. But it was good fun. We were just making it up as we go along. And this one guy, man, he's kind of a doofus. He's a fucking lovely guy, but he just like, he didn't have any competition experience. He walks onto the mat. He's got like shorts with pockets on and stuff. <laughs> and the referee's like, what, what the, have you got keys in your pocket? I know he's like, oh, sorry. He's like, yeah. get his keys and his money <laughs> out. Yeah. He's like, yeah, get, the, get that for me, right? That's awesome. And then he kind of like competes and he gets the guy in the triangle. And like, you know, my coach is in like, finish the triangle, finish the triangle. And he's like, oh, I'm kind of trying. So he just grabs the guy's nose and he pinches it shut. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, what are you doing? Like, it worked. It did. It did work. Yeah, the guy was really pissed off, but it's actually nothing in the rules against that, I don't think. Makes you squirm too. Yeah, but it's like, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, dick moves though. Any others? Any others you don't like to move? What about heel hooking in the gi? Because Tony's like... I was about to say, a guy who uh, does the, the the knee to the throat doesn't like heel hooks I don't like gi. heel hooks in the gi. <laughs> yeah, no. neither do I. No. Yeah. Is it because it's not slippery? Like, you can't... Yeah, I always wondered what the mechanism is, the gi provided that uh, made heel hooks so uh, controversial. Uh, I just like the idea of there's like a part of jiu-jitsu where we just kind of don't... We don't mess we with heel don't hooks. We just don't do that shit. We don't do heel hooks. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Okay. It's like, um... It's that whole idea that chokes are safer than joint locks, mm-hmm. as far as like um, a business goes. Sure. Students that are paying bills every month. Mm-hmm. Well, then in your nogi classes, do you let them go, um, or you ask people not to, or you advise them not to? Or how does it go? It's tough. You have You're to right? be there. You have to be there to supervise. Mm-hmm. You got to be there to supervise, and there's always those two or three dudes that you're like, bro, stop heel hooking everybody as hard as you can every time. They're like, oh, last, that was the last time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I like you and I want to trust you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I like you, dog, you know? That was it. That was my last one. I don't have any more in there. You just put them on one side l- of the they're room. They're looking the... for you every time now. <laughs> you put them on one side of the room, the white belt's on the other, and you're like, just, yeah. no. <laughs> it's coaching tough, you know? Yeah, because that's the other thing as well. It's like, if you teach gi and no gi and guys take the gi off and they're like oh my god now i can heel hook everybody it's like they get super excited it's like dangerous. right it's dangerous yeah the heel hooks I, I wouldn't say it's like a dick move anymore mm. i mean if you do it in the gi obviously it's not a dick move but um gosh i don't know what else and my philosophy is that i think it is a dick move in the gi because ultimately it's an illegal technique yeah yeah that's right, a, yeah, right. So you can't do it in competition so why would you do it in the gym mm-hmm, it's yeah. like it's the same kind of thing as picking me up and slamming me on my head for me it's like you can't do it in competition don't do it to me in the gym like if i want to train heel hooks i will take my gi off and go to no gi class you know so well it's like if we're wrestling with gis on are we doing brazilian jiu-jitsu wrestling with your gi on that's a good question it's judo i mean if we're, <laughs> if we're you know like what Brazilian jiu-jitsu says that you can't do heel hooks with the gi. You know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. so does that mean every time two dudes who don't know all these rules, like, you know what I'm saying? That, that, that's, that's a tournament-based rule set. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So, you get dudes teaching jiu-jitsu that didn't learn Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. You know, they, like, learn submission wrestling now, and they're calling it jiu-jitsu. Because it looks the same. Yeah, yeah, it looks a lot very yeah. similar, but Brazilian jiu-jitsu doesn't allow heel hooks. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, if we're doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, respect it. No heel hooks, dude. You but know it, what I'm saying? It, it Just did. like no slams. It used to. I mean, you look at Elio Gracie's, like, he's got this uh, special book that came out a few years back where he's, like, showing a bunch of techniques. There are, like, step-by-step technique sequence of Elio Gracie showing a heel hook in the gi. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, don't tell me it doesn't exist. Well, Elio was the man, dude. <laughs> right? He rocked his blue belt. He was like, Gangsta. screw all these rules you guys set up for this tournament, man. It's going to mess things up. The crazy thing is, though, he wrote those rules. 
1967, Elio Gracie was the president and founder of the FJJ, or right, Federação Jiu-Jitsu, Jiu-Jitsu Federation of what was then the state of Guanabara, which was like the, the state that Rio de Janeiro was in. And he, along with a bunch of other guys, literally wrote out that rule set. He came up with a bunch of other guys. He came up with the points, came up with the belt ranks, the, the time system, everything. And this oh, is sure. kind of, yeah, 100%, dude. I, I, I have seen myself, I've seen the documents, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have. I'm not even kidding. I actually have seen the original, like, paper from 1967 with, like, typewriter with all the errors and, like, little, you know, cross outs and stuff with his fucking handwritten signature in the bottom. They separate a lot of the Gracies. They do, like, they're, like, self defense, mm. like, stuff. That's kind of weird, you know? And then they have, like, okay, let's roll time. And yeah. they're very different. I remember yeah. friend G used to do this to me. Yeah. We would like warm up with judo throws into arm bars and all this shit that never was used. And I would be like, okay, when do we get to do this rolling shit? Mm. You know what I'm saying? So maybe Elio was doing that whole like, okay, the self-defense moves that are all going to get used, not when you're rolling. These are all like weird scenarios in case some dude attacks you in a bar and attacks you from behind and grabs you exactly like this. <laughs> but you I think I mean? you already said it earlier on. It's business. Yeah. Right? Sure. It's like not everybody wants to come in and they want to grind, go head to head. Because jujitsu is fucking hard, man. Even a three time a week hobbyist is going to come in and it's not easy. Like it is a struggle. Yeah. Some people don't even want to do that. Yeah. But like as a business owner, man, you need to get them in the door. Yeah. You teach them some gun disarm or some knife attacks, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, and, and I kind of, I do wonder because I see a lot of that from certain guys that I kind of think, man, you know better, you know? Why are you teaching that shit to people? Because you know what really happens in a fight. Why are you teaching all those kind of, yeah, now I drop down, I grab the guy's leg. Yeah. And it's like, nah. Well, look at the time, though. when was that? Like, when did he put that out? Like the 80s or the 70s or something like that? The what, the, the self-defense? Him, him doing all that self-defense stuff. Oh, the, the book, I mean, the book's like, I don't know, 15 years old, something like that, I mean, I there was, yeah. I mean, how much money was he watching other martial artists make? You know what I'm saying? He's watching all these like dudes oh, put oh out, God, all these dudes <laughs> putting out like, if you look in the old grappling magazines, there was, I mean, a whole back section filled with instructionals by dudes who have no idea who they are. Yep. Making mad money. More money yep. than Elio. And Elio's like, what the hell, dude? Re remember those, like, <laughs> those, like, <laughs> full-page adverts? And it's like, you buy, like, a 12 VHS instructional set, and each yeah. video is, like, 75 bucks. Yeah. And, it's and like, it comes with a black belt. <laughs> <laughs> but legit, people would have said, man, I got, I need those 12 videos. And they drop, like, $1,000. There you go, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Ahmed. I was kind of, again, math, oh no. And they drop that money, and then that guy, how many fucking VHSs does that guy sell? That's that's a lot of thing, you know? I want so, some of that. Right? What do I Makes teach? Sense. Grab the leg and do what? Hold a gun? Do I teach all this nonsense? Whatever. Yeah, easy, yeah. The that money. shit don't work, but they don't know that. So, mm. yeah, I get disappointed when I see that, because that's not jujitsu for me. And people say, oh, that is the pure Gracie jujitsu, and it's like, actually, kind of no. Because <laughs> it's, it's not. Because those guys always knew that you had one product for the masses, that, and you know the masses, and those are the, like the the high rollers, the kind of the, the the money guys, the students who keep the the lights on, and then you have your fight team, and you teach one thing to those guys and one thing to the other, and then your fight team are the guys who go out and represent the art, and they go out and take on all the challenges, and they show that this is the real shit. And, you know, then the other guys, so the guys are actually, you know, paying the monthly dues because the fight team don't fucking pay stuff. It's interesting right? to me that, you know, like, for someone like Hickson, it's almost gone the opposite direction. I he's mean, gone like, back to He's it, gone like, back to yeah. doing, like, mainly saying sport jiu-jitsu is useless, stop training sport jiu-jitsu, start training only self-defense stuff. When the guy, like, in my opinion, I mean, his, like, he's one of the greatest fighters of all time, jiu-jitsu or no. That was his legacy. That was his thing. Right? I mean, he was, like, unstoppable. So it's very interesting to see that that turn, even though now I would say as sport jiu-jitsu is getting more popular, you know, someone with Hickson's pedigree could make a living just teaching sport jiu-jitsu or just teaching like Bavatuda or whatever. You think so, right? I mean, if, if the guy is like that good, like everybody said, you know, mind reading 400 pound anaconda they used to describe him <laughs> like, because he was literally, he would just tie you up and would be like 10 moves ahead and just toy with people. He really was that good. Why didn't he share that with the world? Why didn't he turn out like this? You know, just create the baddest ass fight team in the world. You know, it's hard to be a teacher. Fun, Not right? everyone can explain what they do. Mm. That's a good point. 
So you think actually maybe he's just so internalized, maybe he isn't able to communicate it? I know, I know personally I, I struggle with being able to express myself from all my years of not paying attention in school and like, <laughs> you know, not, not focusing on the vocabulary test every, mo every week that I got. I was like, whatever, I can speak English. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I've, I, I see like as an adult, it, it, I struggle with that. Mm. And I can imagine, you know, there's a lot of other fighters that have that same problem. It's like, dude, I can do anything physical. Mm -hmm. I'll back roll into the, the gymnastics, anything that requires this body to do something physical, I got that. Hey, especially in the second language as well, right? You know, oh, like, yeah. th those guys are trying to express yeah. like a, a, a really intricate, deeply complex kind of, you know, system a lot of concepts and stuff. And, and it all makes sense up in here. Yeah. And then you try to and it just comes like, oh, and he sounds stupid. I think mm -hmm. Nick Diaz gets, you see the same thing out of him. He tries to start saying so and he gets frustrated because he knows he's not making sense. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? But he's like, he, ah, but, you know, fuck all you guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he's actually, he's, he's not dumb, man. He knows what the fuck's going that's on, right? right? Just that's his right. ability Very to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's, that's, a, that's across like every sport, right? Mm. The best athlete, the best competitor, the best of whatever is not always the best teacher. And generally speaking, the person who is the best teacher, at least in my experience, is someone who actually hasn't succeeded that well. Because usually when you do succeed at the top and top and top of the game, it's you it's because of things you cannot teach somebody mm -hmm. right you have both the grit the skill set and some sort of unnatural s set of gifts physically gifted that you won't necessarily be able to teach someone like how does hickson teach someone what he was able to do like mm -hmm. maybe it was something that really only uh, came together yeah. to to be something only he could do yeah. i just think you know what people think jujitsu don't be like it is do. <laughs> 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 yes. That's fantastic. All right, guys. Well, I think on that note, on that bombshell, right? Man, Jeff, what a pleasure to have you here in the studio. Thanks so much for coming in. And uh, guys, we'll see you again next week for another episode. Actually, no, we won't. Holy shit. Let me, I got to catch myself. I'm not here. The guys aren't here. None of us are here. Actually, next week, we will not have a live broadcast because we've got so much travel coming up. We're going to have to take a little break. But we'll be back at it as soon as is possible. Stay tuned to flowgrappling.com and all of our social channels for future episodes of your favorite jujitsu podcast, Fistful of Collars. See you next time.